with an early consultation being necessary. So basically, the current treatment paradigm can be concluded uh, in the following simple formula. A decompression of a spinal cord compression with a lytic disease process can be performed from an anterior cage with a polymethylmethacrylate and rigid plate fixation as a palliative procedure for metastatic single-level disease. However, if a more radical resection without being radical by true margin definitions is attempted, a staged posterior first and then an anterior procedure seems to yield a far better and a far more satisfactory tumor removal with a very good mechanical fixation chance that's actually very well tolerated by patients. If the upper thoracic spine is involved, the cost of transvasectomy and the sacrifice of a unilateral T2 or T3 route will lead for a very, or to a very satisfactory stabilization. And most cases, again, require a rigid segmental fixation and preferably we perform surgery before radiation while the patient is still neurologically intact and before fractures occur. And that's that. Thank you for your attention and thanks for being such a, a wonderful audience. Dr. Kuntz is up next uh, talking about rheumatoid disease. Rheumatoid disease in the cervical spine. And this is going to primarily focus on the disease and operative indications, uh, given that many of the operative procedures are fairly complex and there's probably not enough time to discuss that today. Um, so in rheumatoid disease, uh, there's an incidence increases with age. There's a prevalence of about 1% by the age of 65. Females are affected greater than males. And the cervical spine is commonly affected in most series that are reported. Um, it's probably the second most commonly affected site in many series after the metatarsal pharyngeal joints. When you think about the pathomechanics of rheumatoid disease, it's basically an inflammatory rheumatoid synovitis, which results in ligamentous laxity, post-inflammatory ankylosis and autofusion, hypermobility with dens and lateral mass erosion, and ultimately which end up as subluxation, cervical deformity, panis formation, and clinical instability. And we just, if we just use basic principles, when we think about clinical instability, what we're talking about as defined by White, Southwick, and Punjabi in 1976, is the loss of the ability of the spine under physiologic loads to maintain relationships between the vertebra in such a way that there is neither damage nor subsequent irritation to the spinal cord or nerve roots, and in addition, no development of deformity with excessive pain. So I think when we think about rheumatoid disease, we can think about this basic principle as we approach the patients. When we think about clinical instability in rheumatoid disease, the axial skeletal inflammatory disorders, it actually occurs basically in two forms. It's either acute instability with abnormal motion or chronic instability with progressive deformity. And rheumatoid disease in the th cervical spine basically affects the spine in three ways. Most commonly is atlantoaxial subluxation. Here, if you look at C1, C2, and this young woman with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, she's got gross abnormal movement. And that's the most commonly way, common way the cervical spine is affected. Secondly, basal or invagination, where you've got superior migration of the odontoid, which often can result in brainstem compression or upper cervical compression. And finally, subaxial subluxation, which can result in kind of this classic stair-step appearance to the cervical spine. It can involve multiple segments, or it can result in a single segment instability where you see here in this patient with rheumatoid arthritis on flexion extension films, you've got one segment, one segment that's predominantly involved in the subaxial cervical spine, and she presented with myelopathy. When we talk about the operative indications for rheumatoid arthritis, I think you can divide it into three categories. Myelopathy, intractable pain, and then the question of abnormal radiographs. I think really the hard indications for operative, indication, for operative intervention in rheumatoid arthritis is myelopathy and intractable pain. If you look at the multiple studies on the outcome for rheumatoid patients with myelopathy treated non-operatively, it's extremely poor. Marks in 1981 presented that 60% of the patients had died at six months follow-up. Bowden in 1993 presented that of seven patients, none had improved and all died within four years. In 1997, Sunahara showed that of 21 patients treated non-operatively, 0% improved, 76% deteriorated, seven died suddenly. They estimated that the cumulative probability of survival was 0% in the first seven years after the onset of myelopathy. And recently, there's also been several studies published in the last two years. Fallope and, 
in 2002 published of 15 patients, seven died within six months. So I think it's fairly clear in terms of heart indications, myelopathy is a heart indication for intervention in the, in the rheumatoid patient. It's important to intervene early because multiple studies have now shown that operative results for RA patients with myelopathy are excellent if you intervene early and they're less favorable the longer you wait. So if you wait until someone is a Ranawat 3B where basically they're myelopathic and unable to ambulate, although some of those patients will improve one Ranawat grade or possibly two, many of those patients will, will not. So it's important if you see these patients who develop the signs and symptoms of myelopathy, which can be difficult to di differentiate in this mutilated group of individuals due to their disease, but if that's a, if, if they have progression, hyperreflexia, some evidence of myelopathy, it's important to intervene. The second is intractable pain. If you look at most studies, the incidence of significant improvement in the cervical pain is somewhere in the 80 to 100 percent range. So it's pretty clear that by stabilizing these patients, you can significantly improve their quality of life from a painful standpoint. When we talk about abnormal radiographs, it becomes some, somewhat more controversial. And the reason for this is that most studies that have initially reported correlation with the radiographic abnormalities, subsequent studies have failed to consistently show that these parameters indicate the onset of myelopathy. There's probably a number of reasons for this. One is that most of the radiographic studies are based upon bony measurements. And as we all know, with the panis formation, although you may have a posterior canal, that measures 14 millimeters, you can have a significant panis which narrows the canal and doesn't necessarily show up on your radiographic studies. And probably there's several studies that have been published now within the last five years that have shown that probably the most significant correlation with the onset of myelopathy is MRI and the onset of the loss of CSF space around the spinal cord and brainstem. But the difficulty becomes that is not necessarily cost effective or practical to serially monitor these patients with magnetic resonance imaging studies. In terms of what people have quoted, many people have talked about it, an atlantodense interval of greater than 8 to 10 millimeters, a posterior atlantodense interval of less than 14 millimeters, a cervical medullary angle of less than 135 degrees, or a posterior canal diameter of less than somewhere in 12 to 14 millimeters. But again, the problem is that studies have been fairly inconsistent in confirming these as recommending prophylactic fusion. And I think there's been several recent studies that have shown that if you look at rheumatoid disease, you can kind of divide it into three broad categories. You can divide it into a relatively mild disease form, a moderate disease form, and a mutilating disease form. And I think what's probably reasonable and what's been published by Crockard recently and several other people is that it may be reasonable to prophylactically intervene in the patients with mutilating disease where they've got a relatively rapid progression of their disease and you've got serial radiographs that show that they've got rapid scoliotic kyphotic deformities with basilar invagination and the operative procedure is going to become more difficult down the line and they've got evidence that their canal is becoming narrowed. But at the same time, you could have similar type of picture in someone with a relatively mild form of disease who's had the disease for 40 years, and you may elect not to intervene in that patient. So I think probably what you need to do in terms of radiographs is monitor the clinical course of the disease in conjunction with serial radiographic evaluation. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Charlie. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Shaffrey is going to be talking about deformity correction in the subaxial cervical spine. Go ahead, Chris. What I'm going to do for this talk is to go and discuss something that's a little bit more controversial. And most of this is totally my opinion, so we can have a bit of criticism of this. Part of what we're doing is, is that we recognize that deformity in the thoracic spine and the deformity in the lumbar spine is very clear cut and we aggressively try to correct it. I think a lot of times we're less satisfied trying to go and do some of the corrections. So here's, again, an example of somebody with some deformity, which I put an awful lot of effort trying to go and correct the different sagittal alignment to get this improved. And is this something that was needed? Is this something that I could have gone and just uh, uh, let this 
be fused in the position after decompression, and this is some of the things I'm going to try to go and make my case for what I do. Well, the normal cervical lordosis is about 14 degrees, and the weight-bearing sagittal axis of the cervical spine passes behind the vertebral bodies. Lordo this lordosis goes and reduces the demands on the cervical musculature, and also a lordosis allows when you inevitably get some type of osteophyte formation for the spinal cord to be drifting posterior to those osteophytes. Now, the sagittal and coronal contours of the spine result in the center of the mass of the head to remain in line with the vertical axis through the center of the mass of the pelvis. And you can see here what the normal line of gravity is, and it passes behind the vertebral bodies in the cervical spine. Now, unlike the lumbar spine, the majority of uh, the weight borne is borne by the posterior columns. 36% is uh, transmitted from the anterior columns in the cervical spine, and 64% of it is transmitted through the posterior columns. And if you lose cervical lordosis, this results, as, this results in the weight-bearing axis to be shifted anteriorly. By doing this, this puts more and more strain on the cervical musculature and has some physiologic effects, as demonstrated by this cartoon here. As you can see, as you go and you drift into more and more kyphosis, it puts more and more strain in the cervical musculature and allows the spinal cord to drift over the vertebral bodies. Now, pathologic uh, conditions which alter spinal balance increase the en energy expenditure, and it, uh, and it makes things more and more difficult for you to maintain an upright posture. And poor spinal, uh, poor spinal alignment can result in premature uh, degeneration, in progression of deformity, in neurological deficit, and most importantly, can result in pain. This is a patient who I had treated fairly recently, and you can see the patient is uh, focally kyphotic, had basically a radiculopathy, and was it worthwhile for me to do a front and back operation to get this spine straight, or did this make no difference whatsoever? And I can't give you a complete answer, although again, my bias is it's best to have a normal alignment of the spine. Now, are the concepts of uh, sagittal and coronal balance valid for the cervical spine? I think so, but it's not proven. Does restoration of the proper alignment reduce segmental degeneration? Again, it hasn't been proven, but that's my theory. And finally, do these new subsiding plates go and promote a kyphosis that is not optimal for overall, uh, overall, overall alignment of the uh, cervical spine? Well, finally, what should we do for each category of patients? I'm going to quickly go over that with you. Basically, the goals for all cervical kyphosis correction include reversal of neurologic deficits, produce a normal coronal and sagittal alignment, at least as normal as possible, have the head centered over the pelvis, uh, preserve as many motion segments as possible, uh, obtain a solid fusion, get good pain relief, and if possible, make it as cosmetically pleasing as possible. And the direction we go depends on several factors. It depends upon the severity of deformity, the flexibility of the deformity, the presence or absence of neurological deficit, and where the presumed neurological deficit is located at, and whether there is impingement. In general, what is needed to be done is some type of anterior column lengthening or posterior column shortening. So this is an overview of that, and I'll be happy to answer any questions.